The other two parameters that we're going to use to characterize our underdamped second order systems we've actually seen before with our first order system. So the first of these is our settling time T sub s. And so just like with before, we're going to define this as the time it takes for the transient's damped oscillations to reach and then also stay within 2% of our final value C sub f. So keep in mind, as I've mentioned before, that this is somewhat arbitrary. This would be a 2% settling time. We could also, for example, have a 5% settling time or a 1% settling time or whatever percentage you want. Um, but in this case, sort of the standard is to do a 2%. So that's what we're going to look at here. So recall that for our system, we have a C final value of one. So we've seen why that is a couple times before. Uh, but in this case, we of course have a unit step input. So our C final ends up being one. So what we can do then is looking at our equation one here for our C of T, if we want this to be within 2% of one, we can sort of set a certain limit for this, this uh, magnitude of our cosine function because essentially we have two parts to this equation. We have one minus this cosine with an, a decaying exponential envelope. So if we can set this to be less than 0.02, then that's going to give us our C of T between one minus 0.02 or less. So that's what we're gonna do down here. So just to put that into words real quick, in case that was a little confusing, we're going to equate our amplitude of decaying sinusoid and one to our 2% or 0 0.02. And that's again because we're talking about a 2% settling time. So what that looks like is we have e to the minus zeta omega n TS because the time that we're concerned with is now our settling time, so that's why I've substituted TS for T. And then we have that divided by one minus zeta squared, and we're setting that equal to 0 0.02. And so it should be mentioned too that this is also a conservative estimate because we're assuming that when this TS sort of starts, we're assuming that this cosine term is at a maximum value of one. So for example, maybe when this is at 0 0.02, our cosine term might only be at 0.5, for instance, in which case, obviously, we're within our 2% settling time. So we're kind of accounting for our worst case situation here. So if we solve this for our TS, we get an expression TS equal to, in our numerator, we have negative log of 0 0.02, square root of one minus zeta squared, and in the denominator, we have zeta times omega n. So we can use this equation and be sort of more precise if we need to, but most of the time we can use an approximation that's going to be a little simpler. So it can be shown just by plugging in values of, beta, uh, of zeta, excuse me, that this numerator can vary between about 3.9 and 4.7. So what we can do is we can just say, well, let's have a rough approximation that our settling time is four divided by zeta omega n. And so oftentimes we'll just use this approximation. But of course, if you want to have a little more precision, you could also use this equation too. Uh, so coming back up here to our response type, uh, let's see what that looks like in our graph. Uh, so what you'll notice is I've added two more dashed lines here. And so we can say that the bottom one here is 0.98 times RCF, and this upper one is 1.02 times RCF. And so with our settling time, we're saying, where does this blue curve go, go inside of that, but also stay within that afterwards? Um, and so if we look here, we see this point right here, it enters into that range, and then beyond that point, it no longer comes back outside. So that would be our settling time. So right about here would be our settling time TS. And so you can see, of course, how that settling time would change depending on what percentage we use for a variation from CF. So if we have a 1% variation from CF, then our settling time would be longer. A 5% variation instead of 2% would be a shorter settling time.
Uh, so it's important to keep in mind what settling time you're using. So the last parameter we're going to talk about to define these underdamped second order systems is our rise time. So another idea that we've already talked about previously with our first order systems. So we're going to define that as T sub R. And just like with before, this is going to be the time required to go from 0.9, or sorry, 0.1 to 0.9 of the final value. Time required for our waveform to go from 0.1 to 0.9 of the final value CF. And so coming back up here to our plot, uh, just real roughly, so this isn't to scale, but let's say down here is 0.1 CF and right here is 0.9 CF. So between these two points on our time axis would be our rise time. So this distance here would be our T sub R. Again, let me do that lowercase just to be consistent. So we've got our rise time, our peak time, and our settling time all labeled on here now. So it turns out we can't actually get an analytical expression for our rise time related to our, our damping ratio and our, our frequency omega naught. So cannot get analytical expression. However, we can of course use a computer and we can get sort of a range of values uh, based on certain inputs. Uh, so there's actually a, a table with some details on how to do that. So if you look at figure 4.16 on page 150 of the eighth edition text, um, you'll see that there. And so actually this number is from the seventh edition, the figure 4.16, I assume it's the same for the eighth edition. Um, I've not checked that explicitly, so unless you hear otherwise, assume that's the same for the 8th edition. Um, so what we can see is basically this has a table and a plot showing the relationship between the damping ratio and the normalized uh, rise time. So one thing to keep in mind though, we don't have this analytical expression, but in general, our damping ratio and our, so let me say, in general, our damping ratio and our rise time are directly proportional. And so what that means is if one of them is going up, the other one's also going up. If one of them's going down, the other one's going down. And so let's come back to our, our figure here and take a look at how, how this all sort of fits together. So as our damping ratio is, is increasing, Remember, our percent overshoot here is decreasing, so this is getting closer here. Now, because our damping ratio and our, our T sub R, our rise time, are directly proportional, an increased damping ratio means our rise time is going to get longer. So if we don't have as much percent overshoot, what we're going to, we're going to have a curve that looks something more like this. So we're going to have less percent overshoot, but we're also going to have a lower a lower, or sorry, a larger rise time. Um, and again, I should probably draw that with roughly the same frequency. Um, so we get something that looks like this. So again, a lower percent overshoot. Uh, these peaks and valleys should be lining up. Um, but the basic idea is our damping ratio can be used to kind of get a good feel for what's happening with our time response. But we also have these rise time, peak time, settling time, and percent overshoot to help us characterize this underdamp response in a little more detail.